They feed on your flaws. They drain your time. And they never leave you alone. Hey, I need to run a few errands. Can you watch my dog? Again? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Discovery Church. Once again, we're in part two of this series called Relational Vampires. How many here last week? Were you here last week? Where are you at? Where are you at? Awesome. You guys are gluttons for punishment or something? I just, I mean, last week was so fun. It really was. And I know that, that a lot of us, we went into this series. For those of you that heard the kind of the, the promotion of it and us talking about it. We probably went into this series, um, you thinking like this message was for somebody else and this series is for somebody else. So you brought your pitchforks instead of your rakes, for instance. So, you know, the pitchfork message is like this where you hear, oh, that was a good word. That's for you. That was a good word. That's for you. And the rake message is you bring it in. You say, okay, okay. So what we're discovering, I hope and pray that through God's word, that there would be revelation, there would be light, there would be more understanding to not only the people in our lives that, that are relational vampires, but that we would actually discover some of the tendencies and areas in our life that we can easily get into this place where we're draining, sucking the life out of other people. And that's what a relational vampire does. Vampires, they, they suck blood from people, but a relational vampire sucks the life out of people. And last week, we talked about the controlling person, that, the manipulative person. And if you miss it, you got to check it out. I think it's kind of foundational because there's a lot of the controlling, manipulative trends that find its way into every kind of relational vampire. Today, though, is another, I think, huge... Um, uh, you know, type of relational vampire to discuss, and that is today the overly critical person, the criticizer, the overly critical. How many of you, how many of you know anybody or have some people in your life that have the spiritual gift of fault finding? Anybody? Anybody spiritual gift of fault finding? I know some people, I mean, they're really good at it. I actually had, no joke, somebody tell me in church, what in this church, another church I was part of the pastoring team with, tell me that they, they had the gift of seeing what's wrong with people and in the church. And I was like, get behind me, Satan. Like, that's not, like that. that is not a spiritual gift, although some people do it very, very, very well. How do we, how do we handle with, how do we deal with that and love these relational vampires, these overly critical people? A key thought that we went into last week that I want to share with you Again, this week is that all relationships come from what we create and what we allow. Every, every kind of topic here of the relational vampires, I, I want you to understand this, that all of our relationships come from this combination. We, we have um, purposefully created some patterns, and we have passively allowed some patterns. Every relationship, the good and the bad, those, those people that are driving you nuts and stuff, it's because you, you purposely created maybe some good things, but you also passively allowed some things to happen in that relationship. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 is kind of our theme verse, and this one here is one of those verses that's inspiring, very hard to do, though. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So it's, what he's saying is treat other people better than you would treat yourself. Uh, look to their needs before you look to your own. He goes on, he says, let each of you not on, uh, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, what's I think funny about this section of the verse is that critical people do this part very well. They just twist the verse a little because they don't, they don't look at their own flaws. They're really good at looking at the other, at other people. And that's not what Paul is saying here, but that's what criti critical people do. And they can come in a lot of different areas of your, of your life. For instance, you might have a boss or have had a boss that was like a micromanager. And he was, he was really, he, the only time he had something to say to you is when he had a fault, when he had feedback. There was no affirmation. There was no encouragement. Or maybe, uh, you know, you're, you're an adult now, but your, your parents are still telling you, trying to live through you or tell, how to raise your kids, how to spend your money, where you're going or not going. You could even have a spouse who is a critical person in your life. And when you, when you, when you have these critical people in your life, it's not only, not only does it feel like the life is being drained from you, but with this one in particular, it feels crushing. 
It's, you're living under the criticism and the, someone else's expectation and why you're not measuring up. It's very diminishing and devaluing, especially when it's a spouse and it could come in the form of you know, making fun of you, making fun of your weight, making fun of your looks, making fun of that dress, making, or telling jokes about you or using sarcasm. The way that you load the dishwasher, criticizing that. The way that you're chewing your food so loud, criticizing that. Again, with the underwear on the floor, what is the matter with you? Or, or that shirt that you wore, again, that shirt, it looks so stupid on you. It could come in a lot of different ways, this critical spirit where we're criticizing and tearing people down. How do we deal with it? How do we love those people that have a very, very critical attitude and a critical spirit? People can, no matter what organization you're part of, it's like, you know, your, your workplace has a lot of criticizers and you probably contribute to some of it. Churches are no exemption as well. How many of you ever heard criticism about a church? Every one of you should probably raise your hand, okay? That's just, it's just normal. Like, oh, the, the worship is too loud. The worship, it, it's, it's too soft, it's, it's, too, it's too dark, it's uh, the pastor, it's too focused on the unchurched, the, they, don't teach, they teach from the wrong version of the Bible, I wish they taught from this version of the Bible, the, the, I've heard, we've heard it all, man, and the pastor's clothes are too trendy, you know, they're too, they're too ripped, it's just whatever, there's always going to be, look, it, it doesn't matter where you're at, whoever you are with, especially if you are going to try to make a difference in this world, you will have criticizers. You will. In fact, there's a quote, it was attributed to Aristotle, among other people, we don't really know who said it, but it goes something like this, to avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. In fact, let me, uh, not to criticize that, that quote at all, but if you do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing, you will be criticized for a lazy bum. Okay, I'm just saying, all right? Especially if, you follow, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will be criticized in this life. It's going to come. Criticism is going to come. In fact, Luke chapter 17, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, it is impossible that you go throughout this life without being criticized, that no offenses should come. You're going to have multiple opportunities to take offense and be offended because there is no shortage of people who want to criticize. So today I want to help us understand, like, how do we, how do we respond to these critical people that are all around us? How do we respond to that? How do we love them well? I'm going to give you some wisdom today, but also just like we're doing throughout the series, we're going to expose this thing. And I want to show you the five different types of critical people that can show up in your life, but also that we can really step into very easily. So take some notes from you guys. Here are five types of critical people. These are relational vampires sucking the life out of us. Here's number one, and we're well familiar with this one, the gossiper. The gossiper is a critical person. The gossiper builds themselves up by tearing others down, right? By making other people look bad, they think they're making themselves look better, okay? And so let me define gossip, because our culture today is this, we we are inundated with gossip in our culture. It's become normalized. You guys know this. You guys, the, uh, the reality TV shows that you guys watch, you know that's gossip. That's just gossip, man. That's just other people's business. There's the, your social media feed, okay? A lot of that can easily turn into gossip. There's even like, sh like news stations, e, e News, Entertainment News. That is all gossip you guys it's all other people's business but it feels good it feels good to to us to know people's business and their issues and their concerns and and it and it feels great here's what gossip gossip defined is okay gossip is when you're not part of the problem or part of the solution yet you're talking about it or listening to it anyway that's gossip. So you think, oh, wait, uh, but I'm not talking about it I'm just being I'm just a listening ear to it that's gossip because so, some people go, well, pa I just people like to talk to me. I'm just an approachable person. You know, they like to tell me their issues, and I don't know. They've always, I've always been that person that people can talk to and, and talk to about. You know, you know what that makes you? People are always dumping everybody else's garbage on you. You know what that makes you? A garbage dump. All right. If you just stop accepting people's garbage, they'll stop dumping it on you. So we have this, this, actually this policy here at Discovery, and I teach this. I teach about this on step one. It's our, our step of our uh, next step classes. I talk about the Discovery family and our vision and values. One of the values I talk about every step one is this, is gossip. At Discovery, we have a no gossip policy. 
So we, we, at least we try to influence a culture that, that people are not talking about other people that are not a part of the problem or part of the solution. I was actually reading up on this, and there's a lot of like secular organizations now that are developing a no gossip policy. I was reading up on one that's a, a print company that they make their employees sign a no gossip policy, and they, they, they make their employees confront they encourage them to confront the other employees, and if they do not, and they just talk about them behind their back, then they get reprimanded. And if they do it again, then they get fired. So, but long before, long before companies and organizations adopted a, uh, a gossip, no, zero tolerance policy, you know, God had his own zero tolerance policy. In Matthew chapter 18, it's not in your notes, but you ought to write it down because this is like at the bottom of every agenda here at Discovery Church when we have meetings, we put Matthew 18 as the last item on the agenda to influence a culture of reconciliation. Jesus says in Matthew 18, if you're at the altar and you have offense or ought against somebody, stop your worship, stop lifting your hands, stop acting like everything's okay, go be reconciled, make that thing right, and then you come back and worship. So that's, that's how much God wants us to have honoring relationships. Eleanor Roosevelt says it like this. I love this quote. Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Oh man. And, and gossip is also deceptive because the people engaging in gossip don't really think that it's gossip. They have a reason. It's always a good reason too because they should know and this is why. And, and I'm trying to, and, and and, or they'll say, oh, they'll put the Christian card, like, can you pray for them? You know, pray, pray for them, pray for that need. And here's a, here's a, here's a prayer request, but, but they're getting pleasure by spreading negative news. Here's, Proverbs 20 says it very plainly. Do not associate with a gossip. See, because at the, at the heart of it, you guys, gossip only hurts. It never heals. When you, see, when you're, talking, when you're talking about someone, you're not part of the problem or your solution, and you're talking, it's, it's, not he, it's not healing, it's not helping, it's actually hurting that person. And in fact, that person that you're gossiping to, you are draining the life out of them. You are being a relational vampire to the person you're dumping that information on. It's a critical person that we can have in our life is the gossiper. Here's the second type of critical person, and that is the slanderer. The slanderer. The slanderer is the person that makes false statements about others in order to damage their reputation. And this one differs a little bit from the gossiper because what the gossip is saying, it may be true, but it's just hurtful, not helpful. It's destructive, not building others up. The slanderer, though, on the other hand, does not care about the truth. It, the slanderer only deals in fallacy in order to make them look better or somebody else look worse. Proverbs 12, 22 says this, like how God feels a certain way about slander. It says, the Lord, what? Hates. hates. You say, oh my gosh, God hates stuff? Yes, he does. God hates injustice. He don't hate anybody, but God hates sin. He hates injustice. One of your, some of your translations says detests, that God just detests, hates lying lips when people slander. Actually, God does not like this so much. It, it, it shows up in the Ten Commandments. The Ninth Commandment. God says, do not bear false witness, false testimony against your brother. Why do we do that? You know, when we slander people and it causes conflict and it inflicts harm, do you ever wonder, like, why in the world do people do that? Why are people spreading falsehoods that damage someone's reputation? Or do you ever wonder, like, why did I do that? Why did I twist what someone said just to make me feel better or make them feel worse? Why do, why do I do that? Or why do people do that? You want to know why? Check this out. Proverbs 10 tells us why. Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spread slander is a fool. Here, check it out. Listen, whenever you have hate in your heart, it will always manifest in slander from your, from your speech. Okay? Whenever there is a hate in your heart, it will always manifest in slandering somebody with your speech. And see, that's why we slander. There's undealt with anger and hate. We're hating someone, and then we're lying about it. We're acting like everything's okay. It's okay. I forgive them when you don't, and you know you don't when you're actually slandering them. You're misconstruing and twisting. You saw a Facebook post about something, and you went ahead and twisted all around their motives and intentions, and you're saying things that aren't even true about that person. It's slander. Why? Because there's hate in our heart that we have not dealt with with God. We become a critical person, a relational vampire. Here's the third type, you guys, and that is what we call the judger. 
that judgmental person, that person that's just very um, excessively critical. They judge very harshly people and things. They, they, they lack empathy for others. Um, they think they're really good at knowing other people's motives, and they, have this, they think they have this like, uh, amazing skill to point out other people's mistakes while minimizing their own. You, you know if maybe, you, you want to know how you can discern or discover if you're a judgmental person? Here's how. If other people's sin and issues anger you more than your sin and issues. If, if other people's sin and issues anger you and frustrate you more than your own, you are a judgmental person. That's how, that's how you know. Jesus says it like this in Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge. Three words. Do not judge. On the count of three, let's say those three words. One, two, three. Do not judge. Jesus was extremely clear, and he gave us very good reason on not to cast harsh judgment that lacks empathy and compassion towards people. Do not judge so that, here it is, you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, whatever standard that you're using to make that judgment, he says, it'll be measured back to you. So we, a lot of people use this. Can I, let me explain something real quick. Because a lot of people will use this and they'll go, oh, you can't judge me. Judge not. Jesus said judge not. You can't tell me I'm doing anything wrong. Don't be judging me. And they'll say things like that. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. The judgment. Because you guys do know we make judgment calls like every day. When you stop at the yellow instead of running the red, that's a judgment call. Do you know that? Okay, so you make judgment calls about people and their actions and their attitudes and their behaviors. Can they be trusted? Can they be not? You make judgment calls. And that's not what he's necessarily talking about judging the position, okay? Um, you judge someone not when you assess their position, but when you dismiss them as a person. That's what Jesus is talking about when you judge somebody. Or maybe here's what we do. We'll assess their position with finality. So you'll assess someone's position, which all of us do, and it's not wrong to do that. You say, okay, that person is, you know, you got arrested. That person's an addict. That person's, I get it. Those are, the, you're assessing it. But when you assess it, you assess it with finality. So there's no hope, there's no faith, there's no compassion, and therefore there is no God in your assessment. Are you seeing that, you guys? James chapter 2, verse 13 says this. Check it out. For judgment will be merciless to one who has not shown mercy. But, he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Not because you set it aside. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about here. Mercy triumphs over judgment because judgment has been fully executed and justice has been finally served at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, when we judge others with finality, where there's no hope or faith for that person or that situation, when we judge them with finality, we are attempting to remove the cross of Christ from that person's life. And, and, and what we're doing when we do that, we're actually sitting in the seat of Satan himself, who is called the accuser of the brethren, the father of all lies. When he makes judgments about us and calls us condemned, he is a liar. He's removing the truth of the cross from our life. And when we judge people with finality about their position in life without hope, without faith, Without love and compassion, we remove the cross. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen, somebody? Are you guys hearing me today? Amen. Mercy. That's, that's, the, that's one of the critical people, relational vampires. Here's the next one, and we know this one as well. The complainer. The complainer. He's a person who's just kind of like constantly, you know, constantly complaining. They're usually characterized by ungratefulness or, or ingratitude, ingratitude, discontentment, um, Here's the truth about complaining that I, I want us to understand today. That complaining is not the heart position towards your circumstances. Listen, complaining is your heart position toward God. Okay, that, that's, that's key for us to understand here. When you're complaining, you're not necessarily complaining. It's not about your circumstance. It's not about your job. It's not about your boss. It's not about your spouse, your kids, your person, your finances. You're not, it's not really about your circumstances. When you adopt a spirit of complaint, this critical spirit, you're not complaining about that. You're actually complaining against God who has given you that job, who has given you your spouse, who has given you your, your, it's a complaint against God. And God feels a certain way about 
complainers as well. In Numbers chapter 11, it tells the story of the, the Israelites just being rescued from slavery. Seeing miracles and signs and wonders, you guys. I mean, a cloud by, by day and a fire by night, the splitting of the, the Red Sea. Just, and and they're, they're, when they were rescued from Egypt, they actually had all the gold and all the jewelry from the Egyptians carried. They, everything that they could carry, all the, all, the, all the treasure of Egypt, they took. And, and, and they, so here they are. They got all these miracle signs and wonders and treasures, and they forget what God has done. You ever get spiritual amnesia? You don't ever get spiritual amnesia where you just kind of forget like what God just did, the blessings God gave you. And immediately when you do that, when you start forgetting the things that God has blessed you with, you will start complaining at the things you don't have instead of thanking God for the things you do have. And so that's where the, that's where the Israelites were in Numbers chapter 11. And it says, they, the people complained about their hardships their less than five star experience in the desert. They're complaining after seeing the miracle and rescue from slavery, right? Going into a promised land and they're complaining in the hearing of the Lord. And when God heard them, his anger was aroused. And look what happens. It says, then the fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of them on the outskirts of the camp. That God got so frustrated at this spirit of complaint that he got so angry, his fire consumed some of the people on the outskirts of their camp. James chapter 5, verse 9 says this, Do not complain against one another, my friends, so that God will not judge you. And then Philippians just sums it all up. Is it, look at this. Do everything. Like everything, do your job, do your chores, do your responsibilities, do, do everything without complaining are arguing, the Bible says. So if some of you are thinking right now, like, oh my gosh, what's the deal? I can't even express my opinion? I can't even like, no, 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 that's not. Yes, you can. Yes, you can express your opinion. Yes, you know what? You can even express your complaint. Hear, hear me out here, okay? You just need to, need to watch how you express your complaint. Or, or let me say it this way. You, you, need to, you need to be careful on the order in which you complain, because, because you are, listen, you are supposed to complain first to God. God, I'm supposed to process my hurt, my pain, my issue. I don't understand, God, what they said and what they did. You're supposed to process that with God and get your heart right before you go process it here with people. Because when I process it here with people who were never meant to heal my heart, when I process it here with people, I'm actually contaminating them. I'm being a relational vampire. I'm sucking the life out of this person who cannot and is not equipped to process the hurts of my heart. That's why you have the Psalms. A lot of the Psalms David wrote were laments where he was, compl he was complaining and oftentimes he was, he was talking about the criticizers. These people are, com are criticizing me and they're trying to attack me, God, and he would complain and vent to God, not to people so yes you can complain but complain to god first before you suck the life out of people and if some of you are thinking like well i can't complain to god i can't talk to god like that listen if you can't tell god then you better not be telling anybody else come on somebody are you hearing me today but listen god wants to know that stuff he does he cares for you he says cast your cares upon me because i care for you god wants to know the complaints of your heart to process those things he's got broad shoulders it's not going to hurt his feelings he wants to process those things with you so that when you are in relationship with others and you're talking about whatever the pain because it was painful the issue it is an issue the hurt because it did hurt you're not sucking the life out of them though you process this in a way that you can speak about it to other people and not take life but give it Oh, are you hearing me, you guys? Okay, this is this, the critical person can be a, a complainer in our life. Here's the, kind of the, the last one. I'm gonna, if I haven't hurt your feelings, this one, this is for you then, okay? Here it is, the negative person, okay? That's just the sum up. I'm gonna sum it up, the critical person. He's just negative and you know them, right? They just, they're hard to be happy. They, they just, they can't be, or at least they can't be happy for long. They find what's wrong. They find what, what is wrong quickly. Here's the, the sad part about a negative person or a critical person because the, the bible says in proverbs 23 7 for as he thinks within himself so he is like you you will become whatever you think about most and and we have to be careful um, with who we surround ourselves with 
And because some of you are here, and maybe you're not like the object of a lot of criticism, but you can, you can probably think of the people within your sphere of influence that are gossipers, your friends, gossipers, complainers, they're negative people. We got to be careful at the people we surround ourselves with because they begin to rub off on us. And I know that, that for some of us, we want to, listen, and I want to tell you this, I don't know who this is for, you can't fix them. You can't fix them, okay? Especially if they don't want to be fixed. You cannot fix them. You, and I know, I know it's uh, tempting to play amateur psychiatrist with your friends. It's tempting, but, but you cannot in one phone call fix their personality and their issues and their problems. And we all like to fix problems. So I would even challenge you, if you have some friends in your circle that are critical people, they're gossipers, they're negative, they're complainers, I want to challenge you with this question. Ask yourself this. Why are you even friends with such a negative, critical person? What are you hoping to get out of this relationship? Have you maybe fallen into this caretaker role where it feels good to be needed? It feels good to be the one to give the answers? That, or, or, or even worse, do we, is the reason why you're friends with this person because you like the info? Or, or maybe you like to talk about that person behind their back and that's the only reason why you like the information because you go... You go ahead and spread even more gossip. Why? Why? Why are, we, why are we friends with such negative, critical people? I think it's worth asking ourselves. Proverbs 17, 22 says this. says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. You see, those with a negative attitude, the, the, the medical science has revealed that they're actually more susceptible to stress and disease. And so if, if a critical person is in your life and they're making your life hard, I promise you this, they're making their life even harder. And knowing that, and knowing that that person is actually doing more damage to themselves than they would ever do damage to you, it actually can cause you to have compassion for that person. I was reading this about some of the effects of negativity. Check this out. The negative person is as lethal as 15 cigarettes a day. It says this, this one, this one shocked me. They are 50% more likely to die prematurely than those with healthy social connections. Okay, let me, let me put it to you in dis the discovery way. If you're not in a small group, you're going to die. Okay? Hey Amen, somebody. All right, here's, here's the truth, you guys. How you respond to offense will determine your future. Offenses will come. Criticizers, slanderers, complainers, and gossipers, and negative people, they're going to come. But nobody dictates your future. They don't control your future. No criticizer, no, no one controls your future. It's how you respond to those critical people that we're de will determine your future. So let me give you four different responses, and here's where you need wisdom. Because there's no cookie-cutter explanation here on how to respond, but I will give you four good responses, and you'll have to have wisdom and discernment on how to respond. I'll give you a often, sometimes, occasional, and always on how to respond to the critical people in your life. Here you go. Here's what you do. Oftentimes, you just don't do nothing, okay? Oftentimes, you don't respond. That is most of the time. Just because someone criticizes you does not obligate you to respond, just because there's a critic. First Peter chapter 2, verse 23, the example of Jesus. When they hurled insults at him, Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself who, uh, to him who judges justly. So you don't retaliate. Uh, you, you, and you don't have to defend every criticism. You don't have to defend yourself to every complaint. What you have to do is trust God. Proverbs 19.11 says this, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory, my glory, to overlook an offense. And it's not, that's not meaning acting like the offense didn't happen. No, that's not what he means at all. What he's, what he's talking about there is real-time forgiveness. It's at the moment of the offense, I'm immediately going to let it go. At the moment that someone gossiped or slandered or said something or complained about something, I'm not going to let it hit me and land on my heart. I'm going to immediately let it go. It's real-time forgiveness. I think um, being, a, uh, being a pastor and being a public figure, I open myself up to criticism. People find it that there is a, they're right 
to criticize people and to speak into other people's lives. And so sometimes I'll hear some of the stuff. I actually, this a couple months ago during the summer, I was walking out after the third service and I was out in the parking lot and someone was in the car and they, were, they honked at me and weighed me down. I thought, okay, this guy needs some care, needs some help. So I stopped in the parking lot and he got out and he, he began to tell me his, you know, his story. He said he's been coming for three months to Discovery and he said, you know, I, I, I was invited though multiple times by multiple people that I know and even family that came, but I didn't come. He said this, I didn't come because I didn't think like anyone like you could offer me anything. I thought, okay. <laughs> and he didn't give me any reason like why. He didn't, he didn't say why. He didn't say it was because of the way I dress, the way I look. I don't look like a pastor. I don't talk like a pastor. It's because your genes. I don't know. It's because your beard, your ethnicity. I don't know what he meant by it, but he went on to say that well, since I've come here three months ago, I've been a part of a lot of denominations and churches and in and out of church for my whole life. But in the three months that I've been here, you have made the Bible so relevant to me that I've been able to apply it and I have grown so much. And, and, and I want to tell you, Pastor Jason, I'm sorry. Listen, you don't have to defend every critic. You let God go before you, okay? You're not called to defend yourself. You're called to obey God, okay? You're not called to, to, to answer every critic. You're called to obey God. So oftentimes, you just don't respond. But sometimes, write it down, sometimes you respond carefully. You respond carefully. Notice I said respond, right? Don't react to criticism. Respond. Don't just knee-jerk react. Don't, don't react to it. Respond wisely to it. Because when you react to it, when your emotion is high, wisdom is low. When emotion is high, wisdom is low. So Jesus very often did not respond. He didn't respond. But sometimes he did. And I looked in all the different in instances where Jesus actually responded to the critics. There is quite a few handfuls of them. Most of the time he didn't, but he did sometimes. Here's one of the occasions in Matthew chapter 2. Um, and let me set up this verse because in this day, the, they had this law, this rule that during the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, you couldn't work at all, but you couldn't even pick a grain to eat it if you were hungry. They had this like art, this rule, like you can't, that is breaking the law. It's breaking the Sabbath. And so Jesus and the disciples actually get caught <laughs> breaking the rules. So it goes one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as the disciples were walking along, they began to break the law, you guys. They broke the rule, the law of of. of the people, the religious law. They picked some heads of grain. And the Pharisees who were watching it, so they said to Jesus, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And then look, he answered. He didn't just leave it. No, he, didn't. he answered the criticism. But notice how Jesus responds. Have you never read? He responds with the word of God. He's not bringing, he's not responding harshly. He's responding to help them, to bring revelation and understanding of the word of God. Of this is this, he's trying to help them, not retaliate to them. Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You guys, are, you guys got this wrong. I need to help you see this correctly. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So sometimes you respond, not react, but you respond prayerfully, with wisdom, carefully. So when your friend unleashes on you for no reason, or your coworker is nitpicking at you, or your parents are riding you, you wait, wait, and respond with wisdom. You pause, you wait, you pray. When emotion is high, wisdom is low. Before, right after you type that email, take a step back, read it again, breathe, and then think, should I respond this way? Before you post that on social media, pray, consider, is this worthy of a response? Is it reflecting? Is it helping or am I defending? Am I trying to help them or am I trying to defend myself? If you're not careful, you can fall into this whole people pleaser trap. I got to put out every fire and make sure everyone thinks of me and looks at me. And I got everything everyone says. You respond to everything. Stop it. You're not called to do that. Oftentimes, you don't even respond. Sometimes you respond carefully. And then occasionally, number three, occasionally, you listen and make a change. You want to know why? Because sometimes the critics are right. <laughs> 
Sometimes they're right. Listen, if everybody is telling you you're a jerk, <laughs> it's probably because you're kind of a jerk. And you should change something about that. If, if your wife keeps telling you, honey, you yell too much at me, you yell too much at the kids, and she keeps telling you, it's probably because you yell too much. If, if your friends, all your friends are telling you that person you're with is the devil, break up with that person, then that person you're with is probably no good for you, and you ought to make a change in your life. Here's what happens, though. Acquiring an offense will keep you from growing because the blame is deferred to another person. So when someone criticizes us, they give us feedback or they, listen, because sometimes the, the criticism we receive is from a friend. It's a wound of a friend that can be trusted. That they, they love us enough to inflict a wound that is truthful than a deceit, a lie that just pacifies. Are you hearing me? Amen, you guys. I'm preaching again better than you're responding. <laughs> Occasionally, you got to listen, though, and make a change. Proverbs 15 says this, that if you listen, that's the key word, man. A lot, of, a lot of your growth as a father, as a husband, a wife, a mother, a leader, a business owner, a, a servant of God, a lot of it is dependent upon your ability to listen to the people around you, to the wisdom around you. And yes, even sometimes the wounds from your friends, the criticism that can come meant to instruct. And that's the key. Listen to constructive criticism meant to help meant to build does it hurt yes it absolutely does but it's meant to be constructive criticism if we do that you will be at home among the wise if you reject discipline you're only harming yourself if you look back on the last couple of months man even this year look back on all think back on all of 2019 if you can just think back on 2019, can you see moments of your year where you changed? Where you said, you know what? There's a character flaw that oh, I didn't know. There's a behavior. There's a habit. Oh, man. And, and, and there was opportunities for you to change. If you, if you cannot look back at this whole 2019 thus far and you have never made a change, listen to me. You probably are a critical person. Because you're, you're missing opportunities. You're getting defensive and offensive at the people around you instead of receiving and growing. Because, listen, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. Change is going to happen. It's going to happen, but are you going to grow with it? Occasionally, you guys, you listen and you make the change. And then number four, always work to guard your heart. Always with critical people, man, there's, you, you, oftentimes you just don't even respond, man. Sometimes you respond carefully. Occasionally you go ahead and make the change, but always with critical people, you got to work to guard your heart. And that comes right out of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. You gotta, it's, it's not in the handout. You can write it down. Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart above all else, it says, because out of it flows all of your life. So, so this isn't the guard like putting a wall up, like, oh, no, I'm not going to let anyone get any close to my heart. That's not what he means. What he's talking about here, when we say guard your heart, it means to not let things um, poison your heart. Don't let it, it bring toxins in. Don't let it affect your heart. Guard your heart. Because Proverbs chapter 12, 18 says this about critical people, that those people, they make cutting remarks. They want to cut you down. That's what a criticizer does, right? They just chop you down. They diminish you and they devalue you and they crush you and they, they cut you down with their criticism. But the words of the wise bring healing to overcome this critical spirit. If today you become overly sensitive to criticism, you've allowed those words or those thoughts or those, the gossip and the slander and the, and the complaints and those things to affect you. If you want to overcome that, here's how you do it. You need to be deeply grounded in Christ deeply grounded like who I am matters more than what they think who I am matters more than what they say or what she says or he says or what they think who I am matters more and I am determined I will not be driven by praise or derailed by criticism will not be if you live for the praise of people you will die for the lack of it and if you fall because of criticism, then you will go nowhere for the fear of it. I've decided, you guys, not to let compliments go to my head or criticism to go to my heart. That you, wanna, you want longevity in relationships? 
Don't let the compliments go to your head. And don't let the criticism go to your heart. Romans chapter 14 says this here. So then why? Why do we do it, guys? Why do we, why do we get so critical, man? Why do we judge people harshly? Why do we complain when God's been so good and we have a history of God's faithfulness? Why do we do it? Why are we negative? Why do we gossip? Why do we, why do we condemn one another, another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? He says, remember, you will stand before the judgment seat of God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So he says, because of that, hey, let's stop condemning each other. Let's, start, let's stop criticizing each other. Here's, here's the kind of a, a statement, a a personal standard I want us to have. If you, want to, if you want to not be infected and affected by the critical spirit, here it is. I will be one who looks for the good and believes the, the best. That, that's what we need to, need to declare today. I will be one who looks for the good in people and believes the best. Now, before you put stuff away, let me, let me talk to those of you today that you've been under the critical person for a long time. Maybe some of you grew up under the person who's, a, who's very critical, who you, you never measured up. It was never good enough. And, and you even today, some of you have the voice in your head of you're not good enough. And it's, you'll never be good enough. And, and they, that person diminished and devalued and cuts you down and crushed you, your spirit. And for those of you today that are even still in the relational, with relational vampires that are criticizers, and they're, they're painting a reality for you that is different than the one God has. I want you to just believe me today and hear it today in Jesus' name. You can be free in Jesus' name. You can be everything that God has called you to be, that those, criti those criticizers do not determine your future. I was reading a, a story just this last week about this, uh, this dog. It was a, a neighborhood dog who was pregnant with pups, and she was walking across the street in this neighborhood and got hit by a car. And, and she didn't die, but she was injured. She got herself back up, kind of dragged her hind legs back to the owner's house, and she even healed herself. They didn't take her in, and she just, but her hind legs never healed fully. So when she would walk, she would drag her hind legs behind her. Well, the day came when she gave birth to her pups, and, and shortly after, the pups started walking, and sure enough, they started dragging every one of them their hind legs as they walked. And the owner thought, like, oh, my goodness, maybe these, they were injured in the, in the accident with, with mom. And so she gets all the pups, takes them to the veterinarian, and asks them to do some x-rays. They've been dragging their hind legs. What's the matter with the pups? The veterinarian does all the x-rays and tells the owner, guess what? They're perfectly fine. Their legs aren't injured. They're just, they're just doing what was modeled for them. They're just walking the only way that they know how to walk. And I want to just speak, please listen, anyone here that's been under the critical spirit, that person who told you you're not good enough, you're not going to, and they just have been crushing you and cutting you down, in Jesus' name, I want you to hear this, you can walk on your high legs. There is nothing preventing you from being everything that God has called you to be, from reaching your potential, from fulfilling your purpose. You can get out from under that spirit that is devaluing, diminishing, and crushing you. God has something better in store for you today. Can I pray for you? Can I speak some life into you today? Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes all over this worship center. Can I pray for you?